Excellencies and colleagues, dear guests. As the Dean of the Nordic Ambassadors Group in Singapore, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the newest edition of our Nordic Green Initiative, our annual seminar on Nordic Green Energy and Sustainability Solutions. As in previous years, the event is held in conjunction with Singapore International Energy Week, one of Asia's most recognized platforms for sharing experiences, best practices and know-how in the energy sector. The Nordics wish to lead by example and with partners like Singapore, an important partner for the Nordic countries when dealing with issues of global importance. The green economy will be driven by innovation. I am very excited about being here on stage today with not only one, but four Nordic ambassadors. This is very special. It doesn't happen every day, especially not in these COVID times. So I've been very excited about today. The Nordic countries, as mentioned by uh, the Icelandic ambassador, all share ambitious goals for lowering our carbon footprint. And today we're gonna hear about some of the strategies in the Nordic countries on how to reach these goals. I'm also hoping to hear a little bit about the learnings from these strategies in the Nordic countries in the context of Singapore and the Asia Pacific region. So I think we will just dive in and I'm going to start close to home. I know that Denmark has very ambitious goals as well. Maybe it's not a competition, but maybe some of the world's most ambitious goals for lowering our carbon footprint. Um, Sandra, I think a lot of people in the audience are probably wondering, how are we going to reach these goals in Denmark? Is it even possible? How are we going to do that? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, yeah, just to, to, to uh, underline that, we do have the goal of a neutrality by uh, 2050. We want to be independent from any sort of fossil fuels by then 100% green electricity. We have 50% renewable uh, electricity today already. Uh, and in 2030 already, we'll, we'll be aiming at reaching the 70% target. So it is very ambitious. And the, the government has recently made a, a green action plan for how to get there. And the main focus are that we are simply going to, uh, maybe from Singaporean ideas, expand our land by building new islands. And they are going to be energy islands. Uh, well, one of the island, we're going to make two energy islands. One of them is on an existing island and the other one, we're going to make a new one. And we're going to uh, do a very intensive offshore wind energy there. And, and we're going to be able to, to generate more electricity than we need ourselves, more more energy than we need, so we want to export it also. The aim, we'll start off uh, building a uh, four to five gigawatt, watt, uh, which is m enough to, to power seven million electric vehicles or uh, four to five million households. So it is much more than we need in a country of 5.5 million people. So we will build a, a grid system with, with Germany and Holland as well to begin with region. Uh, let me tell you that we have already 25 years of experience of storing safely uh, uh, CO2 under our seabed in the North Sea. And uh, last year we started an exciting new project called uh, Longship after our uh, Viking ships. And this is the largest climate project uh, by our industry ever. So this is to cut emissions and also develop new energy and uh, new technology. Because there are different uh, technologies for capturing uh, uh, CO2 and several of them are now being tested at the, what they call the technology center at Mongstad, uh, just in the western part of Norway. And I'm also very happy to, to see just a few weeks ago over energy uh, company Equinor said that it's ready to chip in and also to come in with more financing so this project can be even more ambitious than the government has taught. So let me tell you a little bit about the elements in this. Uh, part of that is what's called the Northern Lights uh, C CCS project, and that is based on the collection of CO2 from a number of industrial sources in Norway, but also from other parts uh, of, of Europe. Uh, so this CO2 will be then transported by ship to a collection terminal on the west coast of Norway for permanent storage. 
And you think there must be a lot of CO2 to, to, to store well, but it's also estimated that the storage capacity is more than 80, 80 billion uh, tons of CO2 on the Norwegian continental shelf. So there's plenty of space there if you manage to do this. But this is of course also being tested out other places in the world. And I think it's very important that we work together to find new technologies that really work. But again, it's been safely captured and storage under the North Sea, under the seabed now for over 25 years. So lowering our carbon emission is, is not um, just about uh, green energy and, and, and capturing um, carbon. It is also about how we use our resources and wisely and how we also reuse our resources, which is kind of a, a, a different path when we're talking about lowering our carbon footprint. Um, could you point to some sectors or areas in Finland where you really see the potential in looking at, down the path of using our materials, resources wisely and, and reusing them? Uh, <clears throat> Finland takes uh, climate change very, very seriously. Uh, we have committed, we're determined to become climate neutral by 2035, which is a very ambitious goal. Well, but in Finland, we are very fond of this concept of circular economy. It's sort of a new way of thinking. And basically, it's about how to utilize, how to use the resources we have in, in, in a smarter way than we have been doing so far. Neste is a company uh, probably well known to, to many Singaporeans. It's, uh, it has a big factory in, in Tuas, and uh, there's an enlargement of that production facilities going on right now. It's a huge investment, more than two billion Singapore dollars. So when I was growing up, uh, I knew Neste as an oil refinery, sort of traditional oil refinery, also having an extensive network of, of, of uh, gas stations selling you know, uh, gasoline to, to, to drivers. Uh, but today, Neste is a lot more than that. But what they are doing is that they are pioneering in biofuels. So what they do is they, they gather waste, they gather, gather residues from uh, food industry, um, old uh, used uh, cooking oil, things like that, and make that, turn that into a premium uh, class fuel. I mean, solid waste management is a major challenge in, all around the world, and in a small and densely populated country like Singapore, waste management becomes uh, a critical task to deal with. And I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the Nordic countries are world leaders when it comes to waste management. We've been at it for very long, uh, several uh, decades, and over the time we have developed the uh, know-how and technology to make uh, our waste management efficient. In my country, Sweden, in the 70s, practically all waste ended up in landfill with uh, serious environmental uh, consequences. Now today, 99.5% of the Swedish household waste is either recycled or turned into energy by using modern and uh, environmentally friendly incineration plants. So only half a percent of household waste is, uh, ends up in landfill, and that small share is, is continuously decreasing. So soon they won't, we won't have any need for landfills in, in my country anymore. Uh, so it would be truly interesting to hear about my panelist on not so much the why we need to decarbonize. I think we are over it. This is about how and what is actually happening on the ground. So at Neste, just yesterday, we have made a commitment to a carbon neutral value chain by 2040. 
And what does this mean for our approach to doing business? It means we expand our climate change commitments to cover the entire value chain. So in our production, our own carbon footprint, we aim to reduce emissions in our own production, so that's scope one and two, by 50% by 2030, and reach carbon neutrality by 2035. Then considering our value chain, carbon footprint, we have a goal to reduce the carbon emissions intensity of all our sold products and work with our suppliers and partners to reduce emissions across scope three. And then finally, looking at our carbon handprint. So our carbon handprint is one organization's um, efforts to reduce their carbon, the carbon footprint of another organization. And I think this is a very important aspect because you know, it's great to sit here and talk about Nest, what Neste is doing to reduce its carbon footprint. But what are we doing to support our customers? What are we doing to support governments and other jurisdictions to reduce their own carbon footprint? And that's a very important aspect. Now, we have made a commitment there to help our customers reduce their carbon emissions by at least 20 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. And we've already well on that target because last year, we helped our customers reduce their carbon emissions by 10 million tons. Uh, we're helping banks to help the customers to be aware of their carbon footprint. And, and that's kind of the first step that we need to take as a, you know, citizens, right? We need to learn what are we doing well and what are we not doing well. And imagine how powerful it is if, if my bank can tell me, you know, what I'm doing well and what I'm not. Is, is very useful information because I may change my spending habits just by looking at the carbon footprint. Yep. Uh, yeah, we consider our customers a really important part of the journey, for sure. In, uh, in Thailand, we recently launched our first circular hub. Some of the stores in Europe already um, have this solution. But I at IKEA, we've always been selling secondhand furniture, actually, through our as-is shops. We never throw anything away, slightly damaged goods or things that people return are ending up in our secondhand shop there at discount prices for people. But we're rebranding that now to become a circular hub uh, everywhere. But in Thailand, we're taking furniture back for the first time. Uh, CCS has been around for a long time. This has not been fully deployed or adopted in most countries. So Southeast Asia, you know, if we look ahead to the year 2025, 2030, we're actually seeing that Southeast Asia is going to have um, six percent of the new CCS projects globally, which is quite interesting, and a lot of that's going to happen in Southeast Asia, offshore Indonesia, um, and I think a lot of the depleted gas fields, etc., that are out there could be repurposed as cabins and so on to store CO2. And I think that's going to be quite interesting, a bit of a game changer. We're also seeing a lot of our clients in in Southeast Asia looking towards, especially the steel players, the people in the cement industries, how are they going to harness hydrogen, which is, some would say there's a lot of hype around it. Um, I think the hype has come and gone. The technology is here now and it's improving, kind of like Moore's law. Um, and if you look at hydrogen, whether it's green, blue, gray, etc., the cost of hydrogen is decreasing every minute because of technology. Um. We recently launched our first ever sustainability strategy in, in Hempel uh, this year. Um, so that has been super exciting. Um, and that's future proof, as you mentioned. And future proof is um, a holistic sustainability strategy. So it really moves throughout our entire uh, value chain. Um, but focusing on operations uh, specifically, we have set a target to become. Uh, carbon neutral by 2025 in our own operations. Uh, so that's quite ambitious, we believe. Um, we've also signed up to the Science-Based Targets Initiative, um, which I believe is the most, uh, one of the most well-esteemed initiatives uh, in this aspect. Um, we've chosen the 1.5 degree pathway, which is, again, the most ambitious one. Uh, that means that our um, CO2 emissions would be in line with, oh, sorry, greenhouse gas emissions would be in line with the 1.5 uh, degree increase pre-industrial levels. Uh, so what are we doing actually to, 
to achieve this? Well, we have key uh, activities that we are looking into right now. And again, it's it's new for us, so we're on a journey. But um, a big important project for us right now is to look into how we can source renewable energy here in Southeast Asia. So today, that is actually our uh, biggest focus for the retailers, is to work on electrifying our last mile, 100% renewable energy, and also working with our food ingredients. And uh, by 2025, we will have a 50% plant-based uh, offer on our main meals at our IKEA restaurants here in Southeast Asia. I think the, the role of advocacy is really how do we convince some of these governments, especially in this part of the world, in the Asian region, that reducing your carbon footprint, achieving carbon neutrality, requires throwing everything on the table. You can't just go with one technology. And, and sadly, what we are seeing in the region currently is, uh, and I'll just talk about the transport sector. Uh, everyone seems to be hedging their bets on electric vehicles. And that's great. I think electric vehicles have a very significant role to play. But what about heavy transport? What about construction? What about your public bus fleets? And when I talk to a lot of governments, what they tell me is, oh yeah, we're going to decarbonize. We're going to have fully electric buses by 2040, or we're going to have fully electric, uh, or we're going to do away with the internal combustion engine by 2050. That's 19 years away, right? Or that's 50 years away, depending on what you look at. So what are we going to do in the interim? Um, because infrastructure is a long game. And um, one of the key things that we're seeing has helped in this region, and but we do need a lot more of it, uh, Corrado, is a uh, more public-private partnership on these infrastructures, uh, development and all that. And also the repurposing of some of these infrastructures. You know, all oil pipelines and all gas pipelines that were going one way could now go the other way. We could harness that to use CO2 transportation, hydrogen transportation, etc. But it will still need uh, some repurposing, you know, and so this is where I think some of the more blended financing instruments and so on will come into play. But at the end of the day, it's really good to see the end users being, you know, make, make this more desired, right? So, and I think that's where the big push is going to come from. What is the key action to give the most effective CO2 reduction within the next 10, 15 years? in your industry. Stephen? We need multiple technologies. We need electric cars. We need sustainable aviation fuel that we can fly uh, safely. I mean, currently, you can use uh, a 50% blend of sustainable aviation fuel. And what we're seeing, going back to what you said, Vijay, about customers and, and consumers, you're right. The demand is now being driven by customers. So we, as Neste, have signed partnerships with companies like the Boston Consulting Group, uh, Travel Action, who are saying we want our people to fly on, on airlines that are using sustainable aviation fuel. For me, I would say technology, huge enabler. I think the other aspect that we cannot ignore is the whole circular economy. And a key component in that is waste to energy. And I think that in this part of the world that is... Uh, you know, we, we still have landfills that can be removed, you know, and uh, there's a lot that we can be, do be doing. And yet electrification rates in Southeast Asia are not where they should be. A lot of people think about sustainability as a cost, purely as a, this is expense, this is a, a big budget for next year. Absolutely not. There is a, multiple ways uh, for, uh, especially in banking, uh, for uh, companies to to kind of recover that investment and, and make a, a good profit out of it as well. So it's not only a cost, it's actually a, a, a very big opportunity for uh, in many industries, uh, at least in banking. We want our sustainable products to be affordable for the many people. That's the key, uh, it is keeping the costs low. And I mean, of course, at IKEA, that's always been uh, part of the philosophy. The price is built into the product from the very beginning and all of that. But um, yeah, we don't want it to be a luxury for the few. We want it to be available to the many, and I, that's why I think sustainability really starts at home. The journey really starts with what you're doing in your own house, and that's where I think we have our our power uh, as a retailer. I IKEA is keeping it affordable, making it desirable for for the millions out there, not the few.
And actually, again, I, I would like to conclude uh, by sharing the same feeling I had after the first panel discussion. This feeling of not going to the gym anymore because you have all the headline, the negative news. Actually, when you start talking about it and sharing insights and sharing experiences, there is so much that is happening that is actually driven by new business model, new type of engagement, technology. And I think what I'm really thankful for your sharing is that those insights and the inputs that you have provided and your takeaways are actually also going in that direction. This is difficult, is complex, but there are plenty of opportunities out there. Thank you all.